Good. So welcome everyone to the theoretical and computational biophysics seminar. This week, uh, I'm very happy to host uh, one of our colleagues from the other side of the other side of the globe, from Hong Kong, Professor Yi Wang from the Department of Physics at the Chinese University of Hong Kong is going to present to us. Before I introduce her briefly, I would invite everybody to turn on their cameras to have a more interactive sort of uh, feel of the seminar, but please turn off your microphone. And if you have any questions, if possible, we can save them for the end. If there are burning questions, I hope uh, Dr. Wang doesn't mind to be asked in the middle of the seminar. Um, and then uh, with that, so I'm gonna sort of introduce briefly <coughs> Yi. So Yi is actually, uh, one of our former group members. So she, after receiving her bachelor's of science in biology and computer science from Zhejiang University in China, she actually started her PhD in biophysics uh, on this campus, UIUC. And actually she worked with TCBG uh, uh, with Klaus and myself actually. So we have quite a few papers together. So very productive during that time. And we still continue to publish together, it seems, which is great. <laughs> and then after that, uh, after receiving the PhD in biophysics and computational biology, she moved to San Diego and uh, worked with Andy McCayman, Howard Hughes Medical Institute there. <clears throat> um, and then in 2012, uh, uh, she started as a postdoc in 2018. She was recruited to the Department of Physics in Hong Kong as a in Chinese University of Hong Kong as a faculty member, where she's a, she's now an associate professor, if I'm not mistaken. Correct? Me? Thank you. So uh, research-wise, uh, she's very much interested in the areas that we work on. You know, applying molecular dynamic simulation to membranes, membrane proteins quite a lot of work on membrane permeability of drugs and small molecules, which is also of interest to many of us. I guess anybody who works on membranes at some point gets interested in permeability, <laughs> right, JC? <laughs> and then, uh, but, uh, but beyond that, she has been also working on plant enzymes recently and also interaction of nanoparticles with membranes. On the development side, she has been also active in enhanced sampling techniques and their implementation. In fact, she is the main force behind impl uh, implementing the accelerated MD that some of us use in NAMD and continues that line of work. But today we're gonna hear from her about uh, proteins that are involved in host guest interactions and involved in, in cell diffusion in three-dimensional hydrogen networks. A very exciting um, title. I look forward to that. Thank you very much, Yi, for being with us. I wish we could have you here in person, and we are going to do that in the near future, hopefully. But uh, this time, thank you for making yourself available in such a late time uh, in your time, and look forward to your seminar, please. Thank you. My, my, my pleasure and my honor, actually. It's really, really nice to, um, to be able to speak. Um, to the audience in Urbana. So I actually was, uh, uh, I, I, I mean, remotely uh, in the NAMD workshop uh, a, a few days ago and was very exciting to see the familiar Beckman Institute in the background. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for, for having me. Um, so, um, right, so I will um, get started. It's actually a relatively short story. So, um, but before I jump into this, uh, hydrogel network story, which is a bit different, I would say, from the familiar topics that we probably um, encounter with, with biomolecules. So I thought I should, you know, introduce uh, the more <laughs> traditional um, uh, uh, topics, perhaps, in my group. So let me see if I could, sorry, excuse me a second. Let me see if I could hide the, um, the floating bar. So yeah, there we go. Okay, so there's that. Okay, so um, so as Imad introduced, so we work, um, so so basically our group's work can be divided into three parts. So the first part is the more traditional protein part, okay? And on that, we primarily uh, collaborated in recent years with, with, um, with actually a college classmate of mine, 
who, um, who is now currently at uh, Wet Hat Institute. So, um, so, so this on the left column shows a, 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 a plant aromatic amino acid decarboxylase, so AAD. And uh, there we basically uh, ran plant MD simulations primarily to show that um, one of the loops, the big highlighted green one, can uh, spontaneously and very rapidly okay, swing from the so-called open position to the closed position. And in doing that, it brings a key residue, so um, a tyrosine. I, I think many of uh, the audience can easily recognize that residue. So that tyrosine is needed for the catalysis, and yet um, the enzyme um, can switch between these two open, th these two states open and closed. So in order to actually work, in order for the catalysis to proceed, you would need to bring the tyrosine in. So MD basically here offered a, 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 a um, I would say um, a first step look at the, um, the, the process of how this could happen. Okay. So, um, so, so that was a, a, um, a plant AAD, and then we actually have um, uh, worked with other plant enzymes. And the middle one is, um, I, I thought I'd spend just a couple of, uh, um, well, okay, a minute to, to describe it as well. So this one is a, another plant enzyme. It's actually um, quite interesting in the sense that it's a special enzyme. So it has the ability to work not only with its native substrate, but also um, something called, it has the ability uh, something called promiscuity. So basically it can monopolize, um, catalyze reactions that are non-native to it, okay? So the interesting thing about this one is that our collaborator actually showed that uh, um, in addition to the native substrate binding site, you actually have a off-center non-native substrate binding site. So, so this got us really interested in asking this question. So let's say you ran into a hill on your way going from point A to B, and obviously that hill is going to slow you down, okay? But what if it's not a hill, but it's a valley, okay? So does that help you or does that hurt you? And if it helps, how much does it help? So basically we try to answer this question from the sort of the reaction flux perspective, okay? So does it enhance? And if so, how much enhancement does it bring? Okay, so having this additional off-center binding site. Okay, so, so for that, we actually uh, uh, used, uh, well, you, we used MD, but we combined it with numerical solutions of the, um, the actually the Smolotrisky equation to, to, to figure out the, uh, the reaction flux. And the short answer is yes, it helps. And there was actually, it, but this answer, it was, was so, so model system studies have been performed before. Okay, so there was actually a very nice 1998 PNS paper on, on how, um, in general, the, um, the valley type energy well actually always helps, okay, to, to enhance the, uh, the, the flow. So our work is basically to show that in this particular system, how much it helps, and we moved to more general cases later. Okay, so, so um, and the right column is just something that we, we are currently working on a different enzyme. Okay, so I will just very briefly, again, so touch on something that we haven't actually published. So this is, a, a, this is a figure of our collaborator. So a uh, picture. So, so um, recently we started working on, uh, well, this one does not come from plant. It comes from fungus. Okay, it's actually the hallucinating mushroom. <laughs> okay, so this enzyme comes from that. And it has some, some unique property. So that is, if you can see the, um, the orange and the, the green, the lime colored parts, these are called the C appendage domain. And apparently they don't have any uh, homologs to existing protein structures. Okay, so they are new domains and they, um, they are involved in forming these uh, metal binding sites reduced by crystal structures. And then the corresponding biochemical assays show that um, the ions that bind there are calciums. And, uh, and apparently calciums can bring up to 300 to 500 fold higher activity um, than sodium. So our job in this particular case was to figure out or try to figure out what was the mechanism behind. Okay, so we basically, so very briefly, we basically ran MD and show that, well, with and without calcium. 
Um, so and show that without it, you could have um, relatively significant conformational changes, um, not exactly at the metal binding site, but close to it. And subsequently, it involves it uh, brings a pretty large conformational change to the protein. Okay, so so that's our first aspect. So we work on proteins still. Okay, and our second. Uh, Branch. Okay, so we actually uh, these are are are, are, are um, essentially have their origins in 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 my days in Urbana. So my first project was aquaporine, and subsequently uh, I I got interested in membrane systems a, a lot, and we worked on it, and that work uh, continued. So basically, we um, so it was nice uh, hearing uh, Nandes talk on on, on uh, um, uh, the antibiotics uh, permeating through the, the, the pouring system. So we worked with actually with, with JC and with Chris, and uh, we calculated the permeability of small molecules using um, a bunch of free energy calculation methods. And in the middle one, we also actually collaborated with, uh, with a group um, at Berkeley who, um, um, who was actually, um, so, so, so we got in touch when I was at UCSD and uh, their group specializes in, in uh, development of voltage sensors. So these are small fluorescent probes embedded in the membrane, okay? And uh, we um, basically performed MD to figure out their orientations, which turn out to be closely related with their um, uh, sensitivity, okay? And then finally, as Imad mentioned earlier, so um, on, the, on the very right column, so we got interested in nanomaterials and studied the interactions between a particular type of nanomaterials called nanodiamond, how they could interact with, with, with the cell. So as the first step, when you come in contact with the cell, it turns out that their morphology, okay, plays a hugely important role in determining how they would enter the cell and in what, whether they could, you know, break the cell, okay? So for that, that is where we, um, we really um, realized the, um, the limitation of MD on this particular method, and we had to combine it with uh, 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 continuum modeling, okay, which um, got us started, and we're currently working a little bit more in this direction as well. So, sorry, I think I took a bit longer than I should, okay, so those are the two directions, and our third and final direction is in collaboration with um, bioengineering um, people and working on materials, and that's really the story. Um, tonight, well, this morning for you guys, and um, um, but no worries, uh, it, it's not going to take that long, okay? So, so the reason that we work on this, or, or the reason that they started uh, the whole series of the so-called hydrogel development is the, um, it's, well, one of the applications is in stem, stem cell, okay, differentiation. So basically these are the cells with the capability of uh, developing into any tissues, and it turns out that their destinations, their fates are closely related with mechanical properties of their surroundings, okay? In vivo, of course, this is so-called extracellular matrix ECM. So depending on, say, the rigidity of this ECM, these cells have, you know, different destinations as listed by this figure, okay? So now the natural question is, can we mimic such an environment in, in sorry, so did I say in vitro? Okay, so I meant in vivo earlier. So now it's in vitro. So the question is, can we actually mimic and reproduce similar environments in vitro? Okay, using something hydrogel, called hydrogel. Okay, so, so there are uh, hydrogels in general are, are a hugely diverse category of materials. You can have all different kinds of hydrogels. And an example given in this figure is actually, um, I believe this is one of the, I could be wrong, but it could, I think it was one of the covalently cross-linked hydrogels. So our collaborator, so who was at UCHK, uh, CHK at uh, that time, and now he moved to um, a different university uh, uh, in Milan, China. So, so he started with a different type of hydrogel, okay? And this uses the familiar host gas systems I'm sure uh, that are, 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 are familiar, are friends to, to, the, to, to many of the audience, okay? So host here refers to the beta cyclodextrin or CD, 
And guest here, at least one of the guests, is our familiar Edmonton or ADA. Okay, so um, now, so let let, let me uh, take one step back and start from the beginning. So these in Figure A, okay, so these green linear structures are polysaccharides. These are the hydraulic acid. Okay, so they themselves cannot form the hydrogel because when you mix them with water, they are just too liquid like it's fluid. Okay, but we can decorate the, the chains with different things. For instance, we can cross link them and thereby they will form a network and that will give you the rigidity that you would see in a hydrogel. Okay, but our collaborator basically devised a, a different strategy that is we don't use permanent covalent bonds. Instead, we use these dynamic bonds provided by the non-covalent binding between the guest and the host. So ADA and CD have, um, as many of you know, many interesting features. One of them being that the binding is incredibly fast, okay? So they may not be terribly strong, but they are exceptionally fast, okay? So the k on is 10 to the eighth, inverse mole, inverse second, so the diffusion limit is usually around 10 to the eighth and 10 to the nine. So they're basically approaching that diffusion limit. So they meet, they bind, okay? But because their affinity is not terribly strong, so this means that they also have a pretty high off rate, okay? So they would bind and then unbind, bind and unbind, okay? So this type of uh, kinetics turns out to be very important to the behavior of the cells within these hydrogels. So as you can see in the schematics here, so I, I hope you can see it's a bit small, okay? So if you place cells, if you grow the cells in these hydrogels, they could easily develop into this star shape within 18 hours, okay? So this is something quite remarkable that is, is uh, not uh, uh, frequently seen. So what's more frequent is the bottom type. Okay, so if you have strong hydrogels, cells tend to be, you know, uh, 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 encapsulated and, and they, they, they are basically limited by the surroundings and they do not differentiate, they do not grow. Okay, so that's with covalently linked hydrogels, but you can also modulate the non-covalent dynamic cross-links. So instead of the fast binding and unbinding ADA, you can choose a different guest. So the same host, a different guest. And this time, if we replace the guest by cholic acid, CA, okay, their affinity, so the k on to k off ratio is more or less similar, okay, but the kinetics is orders of magnitude different, okay? And the cells behave rather differently. They would become these spherical shapes. They would not grow, okay? So this is also uh, uh, verified if you mix the two types of host guest systems and the more fast cross-links you have, the easier the cell differentiate. So the question that the collaborator raised to us is, can you help explain this from a computational or modeling perspective? Okay, so um, there actually have been many um, studies on two dimensional substrates. Okay, so that is if you place the cell on top of 2D substrates and you let the cell grow or, or, or crawl. Okay, so there's these nice, the so called motor clutch model to explain um, the, the relationship. Okay, so but they, these models, okay, do not apply for 3D systems. So it, they do not apply when you have the cells uh, emerge, immersed within the 3D uh, hydrogel environment, okay? So, and, and furthermore, um, they do not consider the, uh, the cross-link kinetics explicitly, okay? So we needed something else. So of course, um, our first attempt is, is molecular dynamics uh, simulations. So we simply put the guest and host in a water box, okay? Oh, and uh, yeah, sorry, there is a detail that I forgot to mention that I should probably bring. Okay. So, so the guest, the ADA, are covalently linked to the hyaluronic acid chain, okay? And the hosts, okay, are not. And the hosts have these little tails, these orange parts, they accelerate, okay? So when you shine a UV light, they would fuse with each other. So you can basically cre create these knots within the hydrogel. So each knot 
is composed of two or three or four hosts fused together. Okay, and these are basically your attachment points. So the guests on the hydro on the on the HHN can come and bind, and then unbind, come bind, unbind. Okay, so this is the system. Okay, so we used MD. Uh, uh, we built this system, and the first thing that we did is plan MD, which is let they bind. Okay, and uh, these simulations are, are are serve the purpose of number one to examine, to give us just a first look at the dynamics of the system. And number two, they provide initial structures for later simulations. So for the first purpose, okay, qualitatively, you do see that um, it gives you this 10 to the eighth uh, inverse mode, inverse second k on, okay? Because the binding is extremely fast. Within a few hundred nanoseconds, 80% uh, of the six, host gas systems spontaneously bind to each other. So, so um, yeah, so that's pretty, uh, 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 that at least to some degree reassuring that we have something uh, at least qualitatively correct, okay? So, um, and then later on what we did, okay, is, well, naturally, so apart from plan MD, we're just apply, going to do steer MD. We're going to apply forces to probe the system, okay? So the idea is, we imagine that we are these little cells surrounded by these host gas systems within the hydrogel. And now we would like to grow. We would like to push the hydrogel and extend my arm. Okay. And in this process, the question naturally is um, can I push through or not? Okay. Or, or, or oh, sorry, the, 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 the more appropriate question is uh, how fast can I push through? And is that going to be fast enough? Okay, so that's actually a question that we cannot answer alone with MD. And we know that from the very beginning. The reason is because with MD, the best we can do is microsecond, okay, right? So, so, so um, whereas um, the criteria for evaluating whether the process is fast enough comes from an intrinsic time scale. Okay, and that I will talk a little bit more later. Okay, so microsecond is not long enough. Okay, however, we, we, we decided to do these MDs anyways because they do offer us a, a, a chance to examine these atomistic details and also they provide at least a qualitative picture. Okay, so what we did here is that we basically tested a bunch of forces. So 10 piconewton, 20 piconewton, 50 piconewton, and 102 piconewton. So the choice of these forces are, are, are basically the following. So um, in acting polymerization, we know that the force that's involved are generally on the order of few piconewtons, so below 10, okay? And 102 is the so-called rupture force. Okay, between the host and guest system, between the CD and the AD system. So this we can find from uh, uh, AFM experiments. Okay, so we tested this range of forces and see within um, a very short amount of time. So five nanoseconds. So the, yes, this is very short, but we wanted to do a lot of them. So we actually did 240 for each state and, um, each uh, uh, guess the system. So altogether, that's 960 uh, calculations, okay? So, so through these type of calculations, we want to establish at least a qualitative relationship between the applied force and the dynamics of the host gas systems. So as you would probably expect, when we have bound hosts and guests, okay? So almost none of these pooling simulations can pull them apart. Okay, so this is probably expected because you have uh, a very short amount of time. Okay, and the force is relatively small. So 10 to 20, 50. So compared with a ruptured force of 100 piconewton, so they're still relatively weak. Okay, so this is basically uh, our qualitative conclusion number one. So forces uh, that can move the free uh, chain segments, which I will show next slide, generally are insufficient, okay, to unlock the bound host guests, okay? Can I, sorry, can I interrupt you for a second? I have a question. So then uh, the, so you, for the host part, so you have three of them connected yes. to each other in each color, like the orange one is three hosts, and then the yellow one is three hosts. Yes. 
So this is, uh, you think this is enough for, to represent the hydrogel kind of environment or should it, should they be connected to each other beyond the trimer, let's say. So why do you use three ah, and not good. more? Right, so, so first of all, the, the hosts are not connected to anything else. So they, are, they basically form, they fuse together. Right. Okay, so yes, we do not know exactly experimentally uh, how many copies fuse together, okay? But, okay, we did run a MD that we, we didn't show here, okay, to try to ascertain that from a steric clash point of view, okay? So basically, when you have three is a reasonable representation, four is still accommodated, but beyond that, it becomes too crowded. Mm -hmm. so, so each of these hosts needs to extend their little tail and then get filled together. So yeah, three- so the, the, Because the tail, I, I remember from your uh, slide that you had a polymer in the tail, in the N units. I thought maybe these tails are very long. So what if you say, yeah, it's here, the orange one. You have uh, an N. Yeah, yeah. Right, 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 right. No, 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 it's very short, short. yes. That's very short, got it, got it. Yes. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, sorry, uh, so going back. Um, right, so basically, um, right, so you can actually qualitatively evaluate the MD result using the so-called Bell model. So the Bell model basically says that, all right, if you have a base K off, okay, which is K off naught, and you have a, a, a rupture force F naught, that you can measure from AFM. Now you apply an external force, then your new k off is naturally related with the base k off via this relation. Okay, so it's an exponential factor. Okay, so, so if we plug in all of these parameters um, and we get an estimation that it would take roughly on the order of 0 0.9 to 0 0.4 millisecond in order to break a bound host gas pair. Okay, so naturally, at a five nanosecond time scale, you are not to, to expect a whole lot of unbinding events. Okay, so all of this are, are we, we anticipated before we ran MD simulations, okay? So, um, and what we actually gain from these simulations, so are, are, are more qualitative measures, uh, quantitative measures, I'm sorry. So, so for these, okay, what, I, what we mean is that we perform the equivalent polling simulations when a given host gas pair is in the unbound state, okay? And in this process, we see that as the force increases, you have a increased correlation between the movement of the chain and the force, which is again, probably expected. And we can qualitatively measure how fast they move. And this is characterized via the diffusion coefficient, okay? So, um, and of course, um, there is another parameter that we didn't show here is we also measure what would be the distance, okay? Or in another way to consider it, the probability for the same host guest pair to bind again, okay? So that is you start, okay, with a host and a guest that is just about to bind, but they are not binding yet. And you apply an external force to the guest, pulling it away, okay? now. Depending on the amount of force you apply, we can measure what is the chance that they would still be able to bind with the original host, okay? And indeed, as you would expect that the chance reduces, okay, as the force increases. So, so basically, this allows us to have a qualitative understanding of the problem. So that is, yes, the forces on the Kiko newton levels are generally far too small to actually break the network to change the topology forcibly, forcefully in that way. However, they seem to be able to take the opportunity when there is a already an unbound host guest and then displace it and place it in a different environment. And thereby, when the next step binding and binding occurs, the topology of the network can be modified. So that is the qualitative understanding that we got from these MD simulations, okay? Um, but of course, that was not entirely satisfying and we wanted more. So that is when we uh, started to do uh, uh, something a little bit uh, uh, um, with the kinetic Monte Carlo calculations, which I will introduce right away. But before that, I'd like to just mention one thing. So we reported 
uh, this, along with the, uh, the kinetic Monte Carlo KMC calculations in our first draft, okay, to the reviewer. And um, the reviewer um, commented that, all right, you have MD, okay, of the host guest CDADA, but you have two hosts, you have two guests, two types of guests please simulate the second type, <laughs> okay? So we basically said, um, replied that um, it does not seem simulating the second type would bring any more new insight because we are already working with the fast type, okay? And even with this faster type, we show that the forces are incapable of breaking, okay? The, 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 uh, the bound pair. Okay, so now imagine that bound pair is even slower than it is uh, probed here already. So in the slow pair, the CA CD pair, it's so so you can expect what MD can tell you. Okay, so so we basically uh, uh, replied that, and the reviewer said, um, okay, I understand. Uh, please do the second type. Okay, so so we said, uh, okay, let's do the second type, and it turns out that that is actually incredibly important because until we actually start modeling the system, we didn't pay attention to a very important structure detail. Okay, and that is, this is our second type. So this is cholic acid, okay, placed close to uh, CD, okay. The literatures, all of the previous kinetic studies that measured and gave us the K-on, K-off for this system are all performed okay, with the thin tail part entering the host, okay? So the problem is when you have it in our <laughs> hydrogel, that thin tail part is covalently attached to our hydrogel. So there is actually no way that this guest can enter in that direction. So it has to insert into the host from the bulky head, okay? So this, does not matter so much for thermodynamics, okay? Because binding and unbinding, the thermodynamics is, is more or less the same, okay? But it matters crucially to kinetics, okay? So we only realized that after we started actually modeling the system. So the reviewers' comments really uh, helped us, <laughs> okay? So, so the first thing that we did then is a a uh, extensive set of ABF calculations because we need to figure out the barrier height if we would like a estimation of KI and KOF. Okay, so we basically did ABF and um, unfortunately the quality is not particularly high. Okay, but because of the very uh, uh, large absolute value of the barrier, so we, we accepted that and we actually considered a, a order of magnitude, the plus and minus error bar, okay? So, so anyhow, so from that, we really were able to estimate that the Kyoff is actually six orders of magnitude different from the ADA system. And that entered into our later KMC calculations. So bottom line is, okay, so yes, the left part of the MD result okay, is as expected, okay? So as we told the reviewer, there's not that much new, okay? However, the actual modeling did bring us to this important uh, correction, that is, we have to um, do the kinetics in the proper way. Okay, so with all of this, we're set, okay? So, 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 so like I said earlier, the MD results are essentially gave us a qualitative understanding of the problem. So if you have a, a uh, uh, dynamic crosslink of the host gas system, the little 10 piconewton, 20 piconewton force are not strong enough to actually break the pair, okay? However, they seem to be enough to, to, to displace the already unbound pair and thereby, okay, uh, through the subsequent binding unbinding, change the topology of the network. So now our question is, all of this is a little bit hand-waving because you are only talking about a nanosecond simulation and uh, uh, time scale. So if you put everything into the correct or the physiological length scale, a time scale, does it still matter, okay? So for that, we basically had to figure out first how fast is fast enough for us, okay? So for this, we basically try to consider 
the process of cell migration. So in cell migration, you would extend these little arms called filopodia, and they are filled with these actin filaments. Okay, so the actin filament basically in the active state, okay, the polymerization, okay, would push each polymerization would add one new unit of the actin monomer, okay, and thereby extend the filopodia by a few nanometer, okay, and this polymerization takes place at the rate of 0.01 second, okay, and that, okay, is essentially what we think is the requirement to be fast enough in our system. So that is, if we look at the schematics, imagine that our cell is facing these little locks in the hydrogel network. So in order to grow, in order to push through, okay, the doors, the locks must unlock within the actin polymerization time scope. Otherwise, my growth will be hindered. Okay, so that is our reference. And then the next question is, how do we figure out whether we are fast enough or not? So for that, we actually turn to something called KMC, but it's actually in essence, it's, it's, it's a, it, so what we did is actually not strictly speaking KMC because we don't have a whole lot of states. We just have two states, binding, unbinding, okay? So, so, so the idea is actually just that if you know the kinetic rate of each process, okay, then you can work out the transition matrix. But again, in our case, the so-called transition matrix is, is just a transition vector. So we just have a K on and a K off for each single host gas pair. And the question that we ask is, given the topology like this, okay, and given the K on and the K off, okay, uh, known experimentally as well as um, the diffusion uh, uh, measured from MD. So that is, so uh, if you, 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 you unbind, you become free, and then you can exit, okay, from the current, um, well, system, so to speak, okay? So, so then um, overall taking care, taking uh, into consideration all of these factors, okay, how fast can the gates be open? So that is basically what these KMC uh, simulations tell us, okay? So, so these are the list of the parameters that we used. Okay, they all come from the literatures and uh, um, we basically wrote the MATLAB code for this and then apply the Bell model, okay? So, and um, determine, you know, when everything combined together, okay, how fast, okay? The, the gates can open, okay, in our hydrogel, okay? So, uh, as you may have guessed, our results show that indeed, um, on average, yes, they open well within this actin polymerization time if you have pure CDADA, okay? And if you have mixed hydrogels, okay, then the probability of having a fast enough gate opening event, which is shown uh, on the top right figure, okay? So the probability grows, okay, as the, uh, proportion of the fast cross links grow, okay? So, um, and then finally, we can do hypothetical hydrogels, okay? So, so because we're doing computer simulations, so we're not limited to realistic uh, systems. So we can actually systematically vary the K on and K off while keeping the K equilibrium constant. And we indeed show that the required force and average time of the gate opening both decrease with the decrease in K off. Okay, so that is basically the story that I want to tell. So collectively, um, the story of the MD and KMC. So basically MD provided the input. Okay, so the K off of the CA, CD pair, the diffusion constant. Okay, so these we take as input for KMC and collectively they tell us a sto consistent story that um, there is a strong correlation between the dissociation kinetics of the host the gas cross links and the cell spreading. Okay, so, and mechanistically, this most likely have arisen from a separation of time scales. Okay, so basically you, um, or, or sorry, I should say the match of the time scales. So you need to match the hydrogel network rearrangement, the topology rearrangement with the cellular activities, such as acting polymerization. So, so I don't have a very good analogy figure, but I thought this one might do. So imagine that these little, these two little dogs are trying to dig a hole um, in the beach, okay? So the sand keeps falling back, okay? So, but as long as you dig 
keep digging and then you dig fast enough and you place your foot, okay, to where it is and then you keep digging and then you can keep moving down, okay? So yes, it's, it's, it's a dynamic system, but it, what matters is, is, is compared with the, you know, the recovery process, whether you're fast enough, okay? So that really is the, all the story that I um, had. Okay, and thank you for, for listening and uh, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So I have a ton of questions actually in, starting from your introduction, but <clears throat> so the, the, the uh, I think, so let me get started with my questions actually before I <laughs> lose it to the others. So you seem to now be bringing in actually a cellular event, what you're describing here uh, at the level of the cell and the cell growth or change or whatever together with MD, which is very powerful. Do you see any opportunity to, let's say, changing the environment or bringing in the, some parameters that might reflect what happens in different environments of the cell to this process? Do you see an opportunity to do that? So changing your conditions and then predict what might happen to this process? I don't know, when the cell is growing or when there are more actins or something like that, do you see an opportunity? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. So, right, so, and the ultimate test of uh, how useful a theoretical model is, right? So the predictive yeah. power. So, yeah. um, so, so far, um, the, the, the dilemma is that we can propose. So basically my, my original hope was that uh, with this model, then we can, we can basically give a criteria and uh, the kinetics. So we can tell our collaborator that we need this uh, K on and K off at the minimum in order to for cell to grow, mm -hmm. okay? So, but the problem is in the real, or at least in the lab, it's, it's not that easy to realize the theoretical right. Idea because you you've got to have the KEQ. Yeah. Less the same. Uh, so so it's actually not easy to find the materials that satisfy the condition. So, so I yeah, so still make the prediction. And again, if they cannot do it experimentally, their <laughs> problem. I would still it makes it more interesting if you do right. a mutation or change the environment and show what might happen and predict that in your paper. If they can test it experimentally, that would be great, of course. If they can, maybe in a few years, they can, <laughs> kind of thing. Yes, that's, yeah. that's a, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we yeah, I, I think we should, uh, we should keep digging, <laughs> yes. <laughs> sure, I keep digging, exactly. Yes. Uh, Nandan, you had, you had a question? Yeah, uh, so first of all, it is a very, very nice talk, Professor Wong. And I have a, a, a related question to what Simad asked that, um, so have you considered when you did the kinetic Monte Carlo um, that you don't have any information, as if I understood it correctly, about the crowding event. So there might be other molecules is crowding in that environment. And uh, have you considered that you might like simulate, for example, Brown dynamic simulation to take care of that account? To, 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 sorry, the last sentence I didn't catch. So have you considered like performing, for example, Brown, Brownian dynamic simulations to take into that crowding event account? Hmm. Or do you think uh, it's necessary or? So, so not for this particular case because, um, but, but, um, but along this line, there is something that we did omit the model. Okay, so it's, it's pretty um, uh, crude in the, in the sense that we, we did have some, uh, um, effect omitted, and that is, so basically we consider the case where diffusion can take the unbound gas out, okay? But we didn't actually explicitly account for the diffusion that can bring the gas back in, okay? From the neighbor environment, okay? So this we uh, was somewhat justified because um, the amount of the free gas are actually not that much, okay? And in order for the, for the for the for the for the gas to be able to come in for the for diffusion to take them to come in they have to be free in the first place and that is limited by the uh, the k off okay so comparing diffusion versus k off it seems that diffusion is faster by orders of magnitude so that allows us to essentially approximately uh, 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 ignore the incoming flux okay so so I, I don't know this I think this is somewhat 
uh, um, in line perhaps with, with what you were asking. But, uh, but, but I think I understand that you are permanently asking some non-interacting uh, uh, molecules, okay? So I would say, uh, yes, so in theory, they should affect the K-on-K off in vivo, okay? So, but because we really don't have a good um, um, handle to evaluate those uh, effects. So, so we haven't got the chance to, to, to include them. That's the power of computation. You, you can create those effects. Right <laughs> in your model somehow. Yes, uh, any true. representation would be really interesting. Okay, Jale, before I let you go, one, I'm gonna ask. Can I get one more question? Oh, go ahead, Nanda. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, so in your second slide, you mentioned that you have some studies based on, uh, like, uh, no second slide. Yeah, here that whether the energetic minimas are whether helpful in terms of. Yeah, I saw your question in the chat box. So you're you're asking about the paper, right? Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I I forgot the last name of the author, so I'm gonna check it out. Um, so maybe I can send you an email, maybe I can. That way it will be easier for you. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So then, actually, now that we are on this subject, is so even if a potential well is very deep, you think it's gonna help the? That's a great. That's a great question. So that's that's the topic of the of the of the PNS paper. Uh, right, yeah. Right. Basically, the answer is. Um, there are a few assumptions. Okay, number one, the particles have to be non-interacting. Okay, so that's the assumption, right? So the particles have to be non-interacting. Okay, and in that case, as long as the well is not infinite, then it always increases the flux. I see. Okay? I remember but, a long time ago. Uh, I'm sorry. Finish your. Uh, but, please. but but if you take interaction into account, so that is you start to, they, they're no longer ideal gas, okay? So they, they have, inter, the particles have interactions among themselves, then uh, there is an optimal finite depth. I see, I see. Yeah. So so I remember that a long time ago, we, I had a conversation with the biochemist because we have been thinking about the same problem when we had the free energy profile to aquaporins, GLPF with Sang Young, Yes, and we yes, were yes. wondering what is the role of this initial potential well in the free energy profile and whether we can make sense of it. Yes, and I yes, think yes. a biochemist sort of mentioned to me that it really depends on the concentration of the substrate. If you have right. enough of it by introducing an additional well, you just slow down things because it doesn't provide any benefit. But right. if your concentration is low in the environment, then having an attractive well bringing it to the kind of, uh, into the pathway might help the overall kind of process kind of thing. So that's, that's what I remember vaguely. Yes, I is think there that's any, uh, yeah. Is there any like a kind of e equation which take into account all this parameter and give you some kind of a permeability value? Is there anything like this theoretical model? Considering concentration, minima and everything, all this, all this stuff? Uh, I well, think um, it's pretty, yeah. But it does, uh, so um, the model basically assumes that you know everything, right? So you have the full control of the potential energy landscape. <laughs> so, and from that, you can work out the flux. So, so, so yes, it, I believe it was an analytical work. So you, at the end of the day, it's, you, you get equations, okay? But that model was, um, if I'm not mistaken, was one dimensional, okay? So, um, but it's, Perhaps in many cases can be considered a really good approximation. I, I will find it and send it to you. Yeah. Okay, Jale, I mean, please. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, I was wondering about the role of the cell membrane in this mechanism. Wait, wait, sorry, which which one? Wait, which the the the, the hydrogel? The, yeah, the role of the cell membrane, like when the when you have active polymerization, right, is pushing against the cell membrane. I, yeah. Do you think that it's going to play any role? Yeah, I th absolutely, it should. <laughs> so, so yes, um, we didn't consider it uh, because we, we, it, it's out of our, our depth, basically. So to include that many uh, factors. Um, but yes, theoretically, I think it should definitely play a role. So, um, but as to how much a role, that is an interesting question. It's, it's hard to... Uh, to tell, so you you would definitely have bending and stretching. So usually the two terms opposing any deformations. Yeah. Uh, 
But uh, the thing is, if you ask me to get have a rough estimate, I would say they could be relatively small because normally with plasma membrane, you should have, um, I, I could be wrong, but it, it is my impression that you could have a reasonably large reservoir. That is, you have a lot of materials behind you. And if you need, you can send them up and without actually stretching. Okay, so the amount of tension that you create may be small. Now, when it comes to bending, uh, yes, it does uh, require energy, but um, with acting with philopodia, um, I think so individual acting filament, uh, acting filament is thin, but an entire philopodia is not that thin. So I would say the curvature energy required may not be tremendous. That would be my guess again. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, thanks. But there's definitely some effect. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So uh, I'm going to ask you something completely unrelated to your main topic. So I'm going to go, go back to this permeability problem because JC is also here. <laughs> you can also respond. So have you guys ever looked at the heterogeneity of lipids and how that might affect the energetics? Because we are running into this problem. So we have a lipid bilayer that is composed of, let's say, three or four different lipids. And then depending on where you place your permeant between two cholesterols, between a cholesterol and PC, you know, you know where I'm going. The, of course, the energetics is going to be different. And we, we are actually revising this again in the lab. Tanner, who is here, is going to look at this, how we might randomize the initial placement, at least to some degree, and get a better kind of uh, 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 view of the, of the landscape by, by doing this. So have you ever thought about the problem or ran into this problem before? Uh, right, so, so I, I, maybe JC uh, can, can, can uh, share his view uh, as well. So, so, so for us, uh, we, we tried a, um, so this top one, okay, is a mammalian membrane. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, from an incomplete one. Uh, converted into atomic resolution from Marinx CG model. So, but the thing is, we only tested a very, very small molecule. <laughs> so in that case, it didn't seem to matter that much. Okay, right. I think, I don't know. So, so, so it really samples and goes around and samples everywhere. So regardless of the initial position, I see, I see, I see. I see. Yeah. And beyond that, it's just the cholesterol and PLPC uh, by uh phase mixture so so i don't know if jc wants to add yeah i'll just say we've thought about it but uh haven't done much haven't done much. fair enough yeah. fair enough no no i mean we have again now that we are moving into heterogeneous more realistic membranes that became an issue kind of sort of what is this free energy that we are reporting for this membrane composition. I mean, really highly dependent on where you place it in. Okay, fair enough. Any other questions? Can I add one point in this uh, heterogeneity problem? Yes, yes. So can we use uh, uh, separate membrane mixture somehow to- That's exactly what we are doing with the Tanner actually. So we are trying to use that idea to shuffle the, the, mm. the initial placement and then do multiple kind of free energy calculations and then Boltzmann average them or whatever and get a better picture hopefully than just placing it in one place. Exactly, exactly. Okay, cool. So if there are no more questions or comments, thank you very much again, Yi, for being with us until such late time. <laughs> we really enjoyed having you and hopefully in the future, we can have you back here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. And your faces. Good night. Okay. Good night. Oh, I mean, good night to me. <laughs> but good night hey. to you. Yes, of course. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.